a researcher from Minneapolis, first put forth the theory that saturated fat causes heart disease. Did you know that that theory has never been proven? In fact, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, a cardiovascular surgeon, in his book, The Great Cholesterol Con, we'll look at that in a bit more detail when we look at heart health, he says it's never been proven. It has never been proven that saturated fat causes heart disease. What Ansel Keys said was, he said, we sure that the research is going to come. Is that science? That's not true science at all. And he looked at a whole lot of countries to support his theory. He had to eliminate the Norwegian countries who've always eaten a lot of butter and creams and cheeses. He had to eliminate the French who've always had loved their cheeses and their creams because they don't get much heart disease. He had to eliminate the Maasai. The Maasai live on blood, meat and milk. Zero heart disease. So he had to eliminate the, the countries that weren't going to support his theory. But this is where it all came from. So 1953, he first put it forward. It gained momentum till about the 1980s when heart disease became the number one killer. It's still the number one killer today. So what's the definition of insanity? To do what you've always done and expect different results. So they introduced margarine and told people to stop eating butter because it'll give them heart disease. Well, did that lower heart, heart, dis, heart death? No. N not at all, not at all, but it actually brought something else up on level with heart attacks, and that's cancer, because margarine is a toxic fat. What I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to show you the molecular structure of fats. I've made it very, very simple, um, and chemistry um, is not my best subject. In fact, I had to go and stay with my sister, who's a who's a, a, a senior science teacher to help me get through my chemistry parts of my nutrition course. But I've made it very simple and what I love about this is when you understand the basic structure of the fats, you begin to understand where the body uses these fats, why the body uses the fats and how the body uses the fats. Remember the Proverbs 14 verse 6, knowledge is easy to him that understands. So we're going to begin by looking at omega-3. Omega-3 is an essential fatty acid. Whenever you see the word essential, it means the body cannot make it, you've got to put it in. So omega-3 is essential fatty acid. And what are we told is the highest source of omega-3? Fish. Well, no creature can put omega-3 into their fatty acid chain, only plants can. So why are fish high? Well, they eat a one-celled algae that's high. So we can do one better than... I'm not really interested in eating a one-celled algae. But the highest source of omega-3 in the vegetarian kingdom is flaxseed or linseed. And the second highest is chia seed. So let me show you what this three means. This is an 18-chain fatty acid and there's 19 trillion in one drop of oil. So that's the magnification we're looking at. And you'll notice that there are hydrogen atoms either side, and they're all connected by a carbon atom. The three means that at the third carbon atom, so one, two, three, there's a double bond. Double bond means instead of one link, there's two links. And whenever you get a double bond, these two hydrogen atoms go, and the two hydrogen atoms underneath develop an electromagnetic field between them, so they start repelling each other. And that causes a kink in the, in the chain. And in flaxseed or linseed, chia seed, there are three double bonds. So that's one, two, three, there's another one there, one, two, three, another one there, these hydrogen atoms are gone. The ones underneath develop an electromagnetic field between them. So this, this 18 chain fatty acid has three kinks in it. So it's a very thin oil, it's a very fluid oil. And what did the British oil there 
cricket bats with? Linseed oil, because it disperses so easy, because it's a very thin oil, and it's a thin oil because it's got three double bonds. So this oil is called a polyunsaturated fatty acid. Poly meaning more than one double bond. Unsaturated because there are some empty spots on the fatty acid chain. That's what it means. So let's have a look at the effect of these double bonds on the body. They create an electromagnetic field between them and that's important for us because we are electrical people. There's a spark of electricity in every cell in the body. And when we're eating nice amounts of omega-3, it ensures our electromagnetic magnetic fields are running well. Dr. Neil Nedley, in his book, Depression A Way Out, he spends quite a bit of time on omega-3, showing the importance for mental health. And I think God's got a sense of humor because the nut that is the highest in omega-3, looks like the brain. That's your walnut. In fact, he's even got some delicious recipes in his book for walnut, I nearly said biscuits, cookies. <laughs> Double bonds also are light sensitive. That means they help us absorb more vitamin D. They are heat sensitive. They help us manage our heat And they act like a magnet to oxygen. Oxygen's the most vital element needed for life. What an amazing oil. But when you grind that flaxseed, and you really have to, because if you don't, if you look into the toilet the next day, there they all are. <laughs> it's hard to chew every one. If you grind them up, within one hour of grinding, the light, heat and oxygen are attracted into there and the oil is spoiled. It goes rancid. So it's a very volatile oil because it's a polyunsaturated fat because of the three double bonds. But if you grind it, put it on your breakfast, you are getting the benefits of all of this. There's a famous doctor in Australia, her name's Dr. Sandra Cabot. She became famous because of her liver cleansing diet book. And she suggests that we daily eat LSA, linseed, sunflower seed, and almond. So much so that in Australia, you can go into a health food shop and buy these already ground up. So I say in Australia, don't touch them because it'll all be rancid. There is a use for your coffee grinder and it's grinding up your seeds. That's the best way. Give it a little buzz just before breakfast every day. Because of our retreat and our kitchen's very busy, we usually make a fresh bash twice a week and we keep it in the freezer. Let's look at omega-6. Omega-6, what does the six mean? It's also an 18-chain fatty acid. The six means that at the sixth carbon atom is a double bond. So one, two, three, four, five, six. There's your double bond there. And there are two double bonds in sunflower. So one, two, three, there's another double bond there. So we've got hydrogen here, hydrogen along here, hydrogen atoms along here. So we've got two, two repelling actions there. So that's two kinks. So it's not as thin an oil, but it's still quite a thin oil. So it's also called a polyunsaturated fatty acid. Poly meaning more than one double bond. Unsaturated because there are some empty spots on the fatty acid chain. What about almond and olive? Also an 18 chain fatty acid. The omega-9 means the first double bond is at the ninth carbon atom. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine, there it is there, and there's one double bond. So you've got hydrogen atoms along here, along here, hydrogen along here, so one repelling action is one kink. I think we can all appreciate olive oil is a thick oil, isn't it? That's because it's only got one double bond. So it's called a mono unsaturated fatty acid. Mono because there's only one double bond. Unsaturated because there's still an empty spot on the fatty acid chain. 
That's why when you buy olive oil, it should be first cold pressed, extra virgin, and in a dark bottle or in a tin, because that double bond is heat, light, and oxygen sensitive. It was only a few weeks ago I was in Italy and I was in a little town, Manoa, and the people that I stayed with, it was a training school, so I was speaking there and they have a television station, so they were also filming me, and they have all their own olive trees. And before I went home, they said, we'd like to give you some of our olive oil from our trees. Three litres, oh, I couldn't say no, but how are you going to travel with three litres of olive oil? So I even bought a special little heavy-duty suitcase and wrapped it in all my, we call this a woolly jumper. You probably call it a sweater, yeah. And yes, I've got it. <laughs> I managed to bring my olive oil with me and it is very, very nice. Coconut. Coconut is high in short and medium chain fatty acids. So short chain fatty acid would be six, eight, ten chains. Medium would be um, 12, 14, 16 chains. I've drawn a 10 chain there and it has no double bonds. So every spot is full. So in the cold weather, it's solid. So it's a saturated fat. It's a saturated fat because there are no empty spots. So as a result, it is light resistant, heat resistant, and oxygen resistant. It's the most stable oil. So which oil does the body like? Which oil does the body need? Well, which body function are you talking about? Because it, refer it, it needs them all. So we're going to do a quick, a quick look at our gastrointestinal tract, which we know so well now. And I'm going to just quickly recap on how the oils were broken down. So remember, here's the pancreas. Here's the bile duct. And I'm going to magnify the villi and show you in detail how these oils are absorbed and where they're, t where they're absorbed and how they're taken in. There's the blood. So these three long chain fatty acids, because they're poly and mono, they're not broken down in the mouth. They're not broken down in the stomach. Remember what's broken down in the stomach? Only one food protein, comes through the pyloric sphincter, remember the bile breaks it down, and the pancreatic lipase further breaks it down, and then it gets absorbed not into the blood, gets absorbed straight into the lacteal, into the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system takes it up to the thymus, then to the liver. The body says, the surgeons have arrived, store them because the body loves using these lovely thin oils for cell membrane function and repair. But the coconut is totally different. Underneath the tongue, there are sublingual glands that release lingual lipase. So the saturated fat breakdown begins in the mouth, comes into the stomach, breakdown's already happening, comes into the duodenum, does not need bile, does not need pancreatic lipase, gets absorbed straight into the blood, taken to the liver and burnt as fuel. What an amazing oil. There was an Australian farmer who got coconuts cheap to fatten up his cows. Now the cows lost fat, put on muscle and started bounding around the paddocks. You call them fields, is that right? So if you want to lose fat, put on muscle and begin bounding around the place, what do you eat? Coconut. And if you want to lose weight, do you eat a fat that the body stores or a fat that the body burns? Burns. I'm just giving you the basic science here. That's how the body uses it. And there's an author, his name is Dr. Bruce Fife. He's written many books on the coconut.
I believe he should get a Nobel Prize for what he's done with that. So you consider for a moment Captain Cook landing on the South Pacific Islands. He's confronted with the most magnificent specimens of humanity he's ever seen. The men were tall, strong, agile, perfect teeth. The women were beautiful, luxurious hair. Had a bit of trouble with his men, the women were so beautiful. And what did they eat every meal? Coconut. No, no obesity, no heart disease, no strokes, and yet they ate at every single meal. I'm in Fiji, and I'm in Suva five years ago. I'm speaking to, I think it was about 3,000 people, all Fijians, and it was a huge double-layered hall, so the people underneath had me on screen. And I gave a presentation on basic health principles, and then I answered questions. And a man said, is the coconut good or bad? <laughs> good question, because what have they been told? It's bad. You'll get heart disease, all because of Ansel Keys back in 1953. So how was I to answer? So this is how I answered. I said, your ancestors, were they healthy? Oh, yes, everyone's nodding. They were strong, yes. Very proud of their ancestry, of course. And then I said, what did they eat every meal? There was a silence, then laughter started. And then 3,000 people started laughing. That's how ridiculous it is. I like to use the BHSC method to determine truth. What's the BHSC method? Bible, history, science and common sense. And by the time you've looked at the Bible's statement on oils, by the time you've looked at science, and this is what we've looked at today, by the time you've looked at history, which we've looked at, what does your common sense declare? These oils are concentrated. We're not advocating you drink a cup of oil a day. You only have small amounts, but they are very, very important. They're important for different body functions. The Bible doesn't talk about coconut oil because the, where the Bible was written, they don't grow coconuts. It's as simple as that. But it certainly talks extensively about olive oil. So let me give you the Omega-3 story, because there's <coughs> a lot of confusion about the Omega-3. So in the Omega-3, so we're looking at flaxseed, linseed, chia, it is high in an oil called alpha-linolenic acid, that's the fatty acid. Alpha-linolenic acid, ALA, has got three double bonds, mm. So that's one, two, three. In the body, ALA is converted to EPA, epocetaonic acid. And it has five double bonds. So that's one, two, three, four, five. In the body, EPA is converted to DHA, decohexaonic acid. And that has six double bonds. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Very thin oil. And that DHA is used exclusively by the body for cell membrane function and repair. Can you see why God made it that way? So that all these changes happen away from the light, heat and oxygen. In the fish, the fish eat ALA. In the fish, ALA is converted to EPA. In the fish, EPA is converted to DHA. And then man extracts DHA, puts it into capsules, puts it in a jar on a shelf and says, oh, this is far superior because it's already as DHA. But if three double bonds are sensitive to light, heat and oxygen, how sensitive are six double bonds? So I myself prefer to just grind the flaxseed, use the chia, and the chia, you can mix it with water, you can make some beautiful chia puddings, you probably Google chia puddings, lovely, because it goes to a jelly. 
So it doesn't need to be ground like this one. You just you put it in a jelly. Make it into a jelly. So that's the omega-3 story. Now let's look at planet Earth for a moment. And here we have the equator. I was showing the children where I that I'm staying with, that I live down here in Australia, so my sunny side is north, whereas your sunny side is east. I'm in the southern hemisphere. Okay, let's look at the equator. What foods are grown in the equator? Coconut. So your saturated fats are predominantly grown in the equator and perfectly designed for that hot area because it's high heat and hot light and oxygen resistance. It's also got strong antifungal properties. It's uh, caprylic acid, strong antifungal, antifungal, and capri acid, capri acid, and also lauric acid. In fact, it's 48% lauric acid. The only other food that is anywhere like that is butter, and it's 2% lauric acid, so the coconut is far superior. If we go up the planet, we come to the Mediterranean. There's your olives and your almonds. Perfectly designed for that area. We come further up the planet, you'll find omega-6. Further up the planet, you'll find foods higher in omega-3. That's why we should be eating food that's grown in our area, seasonal foods at that time of the year. Eudo Rasmus has written a book called Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill. And he shows, or he cites a study where they, they tested a plant grown in the Mediterranean, it was quite high in omega-9. Same species of plant grown further up, it was higher in six. Same species of plant grown right up the top, it's higher in omega-3. So the food that's grown in our area at that time of the year is perfectly designed for our body's needs at that time. Eudo Rasmus also quotes the story of a man who went <coughs> to, <coughs> to live with the Eskimos. But he didn't eat the Eskimos diet, which is very high in omega-3 because they eat a lot of fish, seal, whale, blubber, very high in omega-3 because of all the seaweed grown up there that they eat that's high in omega-3. He, he ate the SAD diet. Have you heard of the SAD diet? Standard American diet, which is almost totally deficient in the omega-3s, 6s, 9s. Within, within two months he was getting depressed, even suicidal, and they had to fly him out. You've heard of the SAD disease, seasonal affective disorder, that is happening in these northern countries. They're blaming lack of sun. There's never been sun. It's because they're not eating enough of their traditional food. They're on the SAD diet. The SAD diet causes the SAD disease. There is a diet that's become popular today and it's called the ketogenic diet. You've heard of the ketogenic diet? Let me give you the history of the ketogenic diet. Back in the 1920s, a group of uh, doctors were fasting their epileptic patients because when you fast, and we looked at this a bit yesterday when we looked at the liver, your fat cells are broken down and your liver converts that fat to ketones and what they discovered is that ketones are neurohealers, ketones are neuroprotectors. And this explains why their epileptic patients were not having seizures. But you've got to eat. So they decided to mimic the fasting process by coming up with a diet that was similar to fasting which was the ketogenic diet, because when a person fasts, they're breaking up their fat stores. So they created a diet that was very, very high in fat, called the ketogenic diet. And it worked. The, the, the seizures stayed away. 
because the high fat diet caused the liver to break it down to ketones and ketones are neurohealers, neuroprotectors. But the people found it very hard to eat. It'd be like this, four eggs and six rations of bacon and quarter of a pound of butter for breakfast. Very, very high fat. So a lot of people found it very, very hard to eat. What Dr. Bruce Fife suggests is doing the coconut ketogenic diet. And the coconut ketogenic diet cuts the carbohydrates right down to a minimum. He suggests meat, I suggest legumes, nuts and seeds. And he says start supplementing with the coconut oil. Because of the medium chain fatty acids in the coconut oil, the liver converts it very quickly to ketones. And he has many stories in his book. He's got two books on the subject. One's called um, Stop Autism Now. And he's got many stories in there of children overcoming epilepsy on the coconut ketogenic diet. And his other book is called Stop Alzheimer's Now. Stories of people who conquered their Alzheimer's by going on the coconut ketogenic diet. He also calls it the modified Atkins diet. And we looked at that a little bit last night. So what is this? This is very low carbohydrate, high fiber. That's lots of vegetables, generous proteins. And for vegetarian pro proteins, we looked at that yesterday, your legumes, nuts and seeds and great fats, we'll just say great fats. He says start with one teaspoon of coconut oil three times a day and build up to four teaspoons three times a day. Now I don't take that much coconut oil, in fact I don't really have it at all. I prefer the taste of olive oil. But if I had any signs of Alzheimer's, I'd start. Something interesting, people that go on this ketogenic diet don't die of heart disease. They, they don't, they're not dying of strokes or heart attacks. They're actually healing from Alzheimer's. Another, another proof that it's the fat is not the problem. So fats that heal, fats that kill. What are the killer fats? Yesterday we looked at the, remember the high High carbohydrate releases high glucose and that's sent to this number one, the cell. Lots left over, so it's stored as glycogen, the quick release glucose stores. Do you remember the third place it's stored? Fat. So the high carbohydrate diet releasing high glucose is causing these high fat stores. And what the body will do is it'll store first of all on the inactive parts of the body and then it'll start dumping it on our liver, our kidneys, weighing down the internal organs. The other dangerous fat is altered fat. So this is your fried foods. But also margarine. Let me show you how they make margarine. Let's say they're going to make margarine out of flaxseed. Well, we've got a problem. It's liquid. So they saturate it with hydrogen ions. To do that, they have to use a catalyst. And the catalyst is either nickel or aluminium. You know what that means? Every tub of margarine has nickel or aluminium in it. And when they saturate it, it causes these hydrogen atoms to flip over to the other side. Now it's saturated. Every tub of margarine is a saturated fat. Because if it wasn't, you'd open it and it'd be liquid. But that structure that I've just drawn for you there is not known in nature. In fact, it's very similar to the structure of plastic. So if you're going to eat margarine, you should eat the container it comes in as well. If you're feeling sad right now because you've just bought a tub of margarine, just close your eyes when you throw it. So what can you put on your bread? I love olive oil on my bread. My husband loves avocado on his bread. 
I actually like them both on my bread. What about earth balance? Well, earth balance is a margarine that hasn't been created like this. It's been created by merging a polyunsaturated fat and a saturated fat together. The problem with earth balance is it's got canola oil in it. We should all be we should all be contacting Earth Balance and saying, please, can you make one without canola oil? What's the problem with canola oil? It's a very cheap oil, but it's high in a fatty acid called uracic acid, which is toxic to humans. So they've genetically modified the canola oil to lower the uracic acid levels. Now it's got the FDA tick. Sorry, but you have to be aware of that tick. It is very high in omega-3 and 6, but it's extracted using heat. So if it's extracted using heat, you've now lost all your double bonds. So canola is canola oil, I don't, I don't eat that at all. So let's have a look at 100 years ago. Where did people get their fats from? Depended where you lived. If you lived in the northern countries, it was usually uh, butter, uh, cream, cheeses. And it wasn't so bad a hundred years ago because they were all organic. They weren't the, the sprays and things we have now and it was raw milk, which is a lot easier to digest, but I've never been able to handle it. It's obviously not in my heritage. And when you think about it, we're the only creatures that drink another creature's milk. And if people say, what milk do you drink, Barbara? I say, I'm weaned, I eat food. <laughs> Milk's for babies, <laughs> which is true. If you lived in the Mediterranean, you would eat olive oil. If you lived around the equator, you'd be eating <coughs> the coconut. The coconut and the olive are the only two oils that are extracted from the flesh of the plant. So women would have presses in their kitchen all through Europe and they could press the oil out of the flesh of the olive. And I've seen it many times when I've been in Fiji before the lockdown, I used to go every year teaching there, have for 15 years. And they grate the coconut, then they put it with water, squeeze it, throw the fiber to the chooks, and then they heat that coconut milk and it separates into oil. So it's not hard for women to make it in the kitchen. No, I don't make my own olive oil, I, I buy my olive oil. But just an illustration to show that these were the two oils that were made because they were easily extracted. But about, I think about 90 years ago, they developed high heat chemical equipment to be able to extract oil from hard seed. So what did they use? High heat. So as soon as you extract with heat, what have you just lost? You've just destroyed all your double bonds. So when Ansel Keys came through with this theory, and by the 80s it had gained, gained momentum, fat phobia took over the world. Isn't that true? 1980s, 1990s, it still is a bit. People like Atkins and the Paleo Diet and Bruce Five, they've managed to somewhat get the public to realise fat isn't the enemy. It's an important part. It's an essential part of nutrition in the body. So when this fat phobia started to take over the planet, everyone stopped a saturated fat, thinking it's going to give heart disease and no one wants to die, and everyone was told to eat polyunsaturated fats. Is that right? Do you know it's the most dangerous? The only way it's not dangerous is to eat the sunflower, is to eat the almonds, is to <laughs> eat the chia seed. So. My suggestion is the oils you use, let them be coconut or olive, depending on your choice. We had a Fijian cook for a while. Oh, he loved coconut oil. And you can make some delicious desserts or natural chocolates using the coconut oil. That's a nice way to have it. And get your polyunsaturated fats, which are important, but get them from the food that you eat. And so the reason why heart disease did not lessen is because people were eating altered fats which damage the arterial walls which cause more cholesterol to build up on the wall. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail when we look at heart health. 
So the most dangerous fats are your altered fats. And if you do want to fry food, okay, students, what oil would you use? Yeah, because it's high, heat, height is heat and light together, by the way. It's heat, light, and oxygen resistance. So if you do, if you do want to fry, that would be the best oil to use. I love the taste of olive oil and I put it into my dishes just before I serve. So I will make my stir fry and I'll cook it in the juices that are coming out of the vegetables and then just before I serve, I put olive oil all over them and then I serve it. Same with my bean dishes. I cook my bean dishes just before I serve, I put olive oil all over it and serve it. It gives a beautiful flavour and the oil is still is in its raw state. Are there any questions as we close? Yeah? Rice bran oil. Now, I, I, I've got a brain that likes to work things out and I, I want things to make sense. So you know what I think? When I cook rice, I don't see any oil on the top of my water. So there's not much oil in rice. So I think they must have a lot of rice bran because everyone wants white rice. And I think some cluey marketer thought, let's make something out of this rice bran. We've got so much with it. Let's press it. And obviously they did get a little bit of oil out of it. So I'm not interested in rice bran oil. <laughs> and the, the problem is that doctors don't study nutrition. What about avocado oil? Avocado has um, some saturated, a bit of monounsaturated in it, so it really should be cold pressed if you have avocado oil. If it was, it's because it's got a lot of saturated in it. And see, the saturated fats withstand a higher heat because they've got no empty spots. I have a two-part question. I'm over here. Um, the first part is, does omega-3 pass the blood-brain barrier and specifically DHA? And the next question, the second part is, um, I've heard that DHA is more effective or more absorbable than ALA, so I'm wondering, do we yeah. need more ALA or yeah. is there something can, in digestion? Can you see why that is so? Do you remember I showed you when you have ALA, it has to be converted to EPA and then DHA and then used. So this is what the marketers do. They say, this is much more accessible than DHA. But my question is, the DHA has six double bonds. How can they extract that with no e exposure to light, heat and oxygen? But the body is well able to convert ALA to DHA. And yes, omega-3 does go through the blood-brain barrier, but the omega-3 is what the body loves to use exclusively for the membrane around the brain cells. Yeah? Uh, coconut oil, is there a difference between refined and virgin? Uh, they don't spray coconut and heat doesn't hurt it, but Sometimes they extract the coconut using a chemical process. That's why it's good to buy organic. And of course, in its natural state as much as possible. Okay, I've heard, there, it's a double question too, is that uh, um, omega-6s, too much of it can bring on inflammation. Yeah. Okay, so then there's a limit on um, the amount of um, sunflower oil one would be using or yeah I don't system. I don't use sunflower oil at all because they extract it using heat mm -hmm. which means it hurts this but if but it is true too much omega-6 can increase inflammation not enough omega-3 but if you get your your nine sixes and threes in food not a problem because it's perfectly balanced okay and then also I've um, heard about phytates with the nut in eating too much phytates nuts, seeds, 
yeah. um, can also cause absorption. That's right. Of and, and what you've got to think about it, if the only food you ate was the food you grew, all your nuts drop once a year. You're not going to eat them all in two months and have no nuts for the rest of the year. And if you're at the table and all the nuts are in their shells, after about six or seven nuts, people are getting sick of it and they've got to go back to work. So the message from nature with nuts is, you don't eat a whole cup full. We should be eating six to eight nuts. My six foot six brother-in-law can probably get away with 10. But that's how much we should be eating every meal, just a small amount. Because I know in some of the recipe books, they ask for like maybe a cup, cup and a half of, um, let's say walnuts or cashews. Um, that's right, cashews. but if, if you have a look at how many people are eating that, so it might be a cup of walnuts, but 20 people are gonna eat that dish. So everyone's only getting a little bit. That's, that's what I found. A lot of your raw vegan cheesecakes and things have a lot of nuts in them, but everyone's just getting a little slice. So they're very rich. I want to ask you a question about um, uh, gallbladder, the function. Uh, we talked about it storing bile and then gallbladder stones. And perhaps some people advocate using oils to help dissolve them. Yes, that's right. There's a recipe for a gallbladder cleanse where you drink half a cup of olive oil and half a cup of grapefruit juice before you go to bed. Um, it's been used for many, many decades, probably centuries. And what it does is it causes the gallbladder to release a lot of bile to cope with all this oil and in the process it spits out stones. It's quite a, a hard process to go through. But in my book, self Heal Bile Design, I have a gentle liver cleanse where you go over five days and it, you'll find that a lot gentler. What about sesame oil? Sesame oil. Sesame is very high in an antioxidant called sesamol. And that antioxidant prevents sesa, the oil in the sesame from deteriorating. We usually have sesame oil that we might put a few drops in a stir fry sometimes, but it's a very strong oil. But we, prob we use a lot of tahini. And tahini doesn't go rancid because of the sesamol, which is an antioxidant. Uh, previously, we were advised, um, my wife and I, that all oils were considered somewhat of a refined food, and so to avoid them whenever possible. Do you advocate avoiding all oils? I mean, you, even you said you, you put olive oil like at the last stage for taste. Um, is that where's well, the balance between? Um, the, the, is there, is there a, a health benefit to the raw oil by itself outside of the fruit, or is it? Yeah, Where, where's the balance? Um, the, the balance is that these oils have been eaten for centuries. And that's why I like to show you the molecular structure of the oils and show you how the body uses them. And there's a lovely story in the Bible where God puts his seal on olive oil. And the prophet Elijah was told to tell King Ahab, we might know the story, that there's going to be no rain for three years if he doesn't throw his idols away. And God, God told Elijah to go to a woman, a widow, who would feed him for the three years. And this is what the Bible says. He says to the woman, God has said that the meal will not fail and the oil will not lack in the three years and that's exactly what happened. So every day the lady went to her barrel and there was a little bit of flour and she went to her cruise and there was a little bit of oil. Who put the oil there? God put the oil there. So that's, to me, that's the seal of God. So if someone says to me, you shouldn't be eating olive oil, I say that's unbiblical. Uh, what about flaxseed oil? Flaxseed oil. Well, if you can buy flaxseed oil in a tin in a fridge and it has no bitter taste, they've been able to extract it with no exposure to light, heat and oxygen. But if the flax oil have, has the slightest bitterness in it, 
just paint your cricket back with it or your furniture because that bitterness shows that it's gone rancid because it's had ex the double bonds have had exposure to light, heat and oxygen. So they sell it in black uh, plastic bottles. Is that the same as a tin? Well, if it's black, <laughs> okay. it's no light, light heat or oxygen. Okay. I think we've got, let's just do two more. Okay, I do have two questions, <laughs> quick ones. For those of us that have leaky gut diagnosis, do you have something, a program in your materials? Sorry, what sort of diagnosis? Leaky gut. Leaky gut. Now, you, you saw the last presentation where I showed the, the uh, flora, gut flora gets broken down. Mm -hmm. um, that's basically your leaky gut, so that can be restored. Slippery elm will restore it, and also foods high in uh, your natural probiotics can restore it. Okay. Which kind of probiotics? Which, sorry? The spore, spore probiotics, or what kind of probiotics? I'm not familiar with American probiotics, but okay. just look for a vegetarian one, and okay. it's their best taken three quarters of an hour before the meal. Okay. So they go way, way, way down. Thank you. And the last one is, what percentage of raw versus cooked food do you recommend? Um, if someone, you know the man I was talking about who was going to the bathroom six times a day, he should not have raw food because his colon is so inflamed. So it depends on the person. But I myself, I aim for 60%, 50% raw and 50% cooked because cooked will deliver what raw won't and raw will deliver what cooked won't. So that's what I aim for. And if I, if I went on an all raw diet, after a month, if I turned sideways, you wouldn't see me. So there might be a time for an all raw diet when someone is very large. So it depends on the person. Okay, we've had a nice lot of questions tonight and I'm glad that um, you have them and we've been able to answer them because there are a lot of perplexities on the oil. So I'm going to hand it over to, to Nikki. Oh, oh not or Nikki. Or other half. This is not Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come back tomorrow night. It's 5 o'clock for a meal, 6 o'clock for insomnia and healing the mind and safeguarding against depression. So with that, I'd like you to... Actually, let's stand and bow our heads for prayer and pray together. Father, thank you for what we have learned and shared. Thank you for the natural um, diet we find and the natural healing we find that you have created for us and our, that our bodies are made to heal themselves if we take care of them for the most part. Uh, thank you for things we've learned. I pray you'll give us a safe uh, ride home and uh, return tomorrow night. I thank you for all you've done for us, and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And good night.